Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, tonight's session is titled, Why Do We Still Have the Electoral College? And I'll say at that time with a period and not a question. It's my pleasure to welcome Alex uh, Kayser to, to the uh, program. Alex, if you'd unmute yourself and join us, I'm going to hand over the, uh, the PowerPoint uh, slides to you. I also want to thank, by the way, and acknowledge David Olson, who is with us as tonight's TA. David has curated a bunch of resources that are found in the folder. He's also going to be dropping links to those and uh, asking some questions in the chat box. Um, Alex, we're here. We're, we're ready to learn uh, more about um, what I suspect you've been talking about uh, ad nauseum for the last month or more. <laughs> well, welcome to the show. Thank you, Andy. And uh, thank, thank you and Libby Taylor and others uh, from the National <laughs> Humanities Center um, for having invited me and for, and, and for having arranged and choreographed uh, this event and thanks to all of you who are out there. Uh, I was going to say who have braved a rainy, windy night, but probably uh, most of you haven't had to do that. But but thank you all for uh, for coming. Um, and let me see whether I can fulfill my educational mandate here. <laughs> it is um, a mandate. Right. Uh, I, 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 <laughs> I, I know you've been doing this a lot this week. Um, I, I think you told me this is probably your, what, 150th talk this week. Um, <laughs> and I, 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 wonder if I, can, quite, but... I wonder if I can start by just a quick question for me to sort of frame, frame things before you get into your PowerPoint slides. You speak, I think, to many different kinds of audiences, general public, students, uh, professionals like you are tonight. You must get one question constantly, all the time. What, what's the question you get asked all the time about the Electoral College? There are two. There, there are two that leap right into my mind and that seem to come up every time. One was, one is, where did that idea come from? <laughs> you know, where did the whole thing start? Who came up with this screwball notion? Um, and then the other is, is the other question, at, which comes at the end of such talks, is uh, is there any chance of changing it uh, or, or or figuring out a new system? Those those are the questions that I mean. There are other questions that show up with with frequency, but those are the two uh, perennials, I might say. And it sounds like bookends to what you might share tonight. So, <laughs> so thank you. I think you just framed you framed the next hour and a half. Thank you. Okay. Well, again, thank you, and thanks to all of you. And um, I hope I'll make a quick adjustment to this format, although I, I have been giving uh, a great many talks on this subject uh, since my book was published at the end of July. And since the Electoral College seems to be a matter of some interest uh, to, uh, to many people out there, I, was, you know, I mean, we don't need to be reminded that there is an election coming, but it's the Electoral College always shapes presidential elections. In this election, it's distinctive. I think it's the only election that I can remember, and uh, and it's the only election I think that I know of where uh, the outcome of the popular vote is presumed and widely agreed upon. Very few people uh, think. I'm, I, have, I don't know of anyone, or certainly not any pollster, who thinks that President Trump will win. Uh, the national popular vote this year, just as he did not um, in 2016. But there is suspense in this election, a great deal of it, uh, precisely because of the Electoral College. So I, I, uh, I wrote this book, I mean, and I, I, a few words about the process that led me to write the book. I think it started for me after the 2000 election when uh, Al Gore won the popular vote, but did not win, did not become president, and that that sort of raised an issue that had been in abeyance. This is the last time that it happened, it was in the 19th century. What struck me as a historian, and I had just published a book on the history of the right to vote uh, in 2000. What struck me was how little reaction there was in terms of electoral college reform in the aftermath of the 2000 election. I then began gradually over you know, a certain number of years poking around, learning bits and pieces more about this institution and its history, and they only deepened the puzzle. Um, for example, one thing I learned 
was that between, depending on how you count, and it's a little imprecise, but some, something between 800 and 1,000 um, constitutional amendments have been introduced into Congress to significantly reform the Electoral College um, or to abolish it altogether and replace it with something else. There have been more, res more amendment resolutions on this subject than on any other uh, in the entirety of Amer American history. That suggested a degree of discontent that had been longstanding. And I should say, these amendment resolutions start in about 1800. Um, one, one historian friend of mine has quipped that the Electoral College was archaic um, and really obsolete by 1800 already. So I learned that there have been a lot of attempts. I also learned that there have been a number of these attempts had come quite close. Uh, six times one branch of Congress has approved a constitutional amendment. And on two of those occasions, the, the second branch also came close. And I'll be talking a little bit uh, about about both of those incidents. And I also learned this again. This is in my early poking around in this subject. Um, I, I learned that public opinion polls, as long as we've had them, as we've had reliable polls, which goes back to the mid-1940s, indicate that a majority of the American people uh, would prefer to get rid of the Electoral College and replace it with a national popular vote. Um, so uh, we have this, you know, in my mind, we have this institution that created some hazards, had some clear downsides, uh, was unpopular with the public, uh, was unpopular enough with Congress to lead to repeated amendment resolutions, so why did we still have it? And that set me off on what became a much more extensive research uh, adventure than I had believed possible, um, and I, I really went full time into the book in about 2015, and it was fi I finally completed it last spring. Um, but I'm going to do with you f f tonight, um, not with you, but to you or for you, or what we will do together, is not to structure a talk as I do at, on other occasions by presenting the argument of the book. I think that. For, for you, we're trying to teach most of whom are trying to teach younger people about this. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure that that would be the best way to approach this. What I want to do is to use a series of slides um, to talk about specific features uh, of the Electoral College and its history, and to tell particular stories, which might prove to be of interest to you. And of course, anyone who's interested can find. Uh, more detailed and richer versions of these stories in my book. So let's start at the beginning, so to speak, and um, with the U.S. Constitution, Article 2, Section 1, each state shall appoint in such manner as the legislature thereof may direct a number of electors. You can read this. I don't have to read it aloud to you. You can read it on the screen. The backstory here, this is from the 1787 Constitution. The backstory here is that when the framers arrived in Philadelphia to write a new constitution, there was widespread agreement that there should be a chief executive. Um, they even agreed pretty early on in the convention that he should be called the president. Um, and they did not have any agreement about how the president should be chosen. Uh, to use the language of the 21st century, the default concept was that Congress would choose the president. And a, a number of members of the convention indicated their support for that idea. There was a lot of, there was uh, substantial interest in it, but it was hardly unanimous. And there were, began to be serious criticism saying, look, if Congress creates the president, then there's no separation of powers. And part of what we're trying to do is to create separation of powers to have not too powerful uh, a central government. Uh, so they, they would talk about having the Congress do it, and then they would back away from it and talk about other ideas. They did talk about having a national popular vote. Uh, and there were people who favored it, including James Madison. Uh, but there were others who thought that the communications and transportation across the country were not adequate for the electorate to be familiar uh, with presidential candidates. Thus, it would be better to have some other group 
uh, do it. Uh, there are people who thought it would just be impractical. You know, the, the, how do we count the votes uh, in in Georgia and get them to wherever the go- the federal government is? They just thought it would be uh, very impractical. And uh, the slave states did not like the idea of a national popular vote in general because they wanted to wield some influence in presidential selection as they did in in, in Congress on behalf of their slaves or by virtue of their having slaves. In Congress, this was, of course, the three-fifths clause. Uh, so they went around all summer. Uh, they, they went up and down and all that. But Ma- oh, let me just continue this one thought. Madison, who was obviously from a slave state and was a slave owner himself, recognized that a national popular vote would disadvantage the slave states, but he thought that for the good of the nation, it would be the best way to proceed anyway. Uh, but he didn't have a lot of company. Um, it got to the end of the summer. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever spent a summer in Philadelphia, but at the end of August, it can be pretty hot and steamy. And those of you who are in North Carolina and nearby states certainly know from hot and steamy. I, I lived in North Carolina for a number of years, so I'm I'm not simply speaking stereotypes there. Um, but um, the, 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 the framers of the convention uh, were tired. They had written most of the new constitution, but there were some questions they had not settled. So what did they do? Like any good gathering of people, they decided to go on vacation and leave a committee in charge of dealing with this. It was called the Committee on Postponed Parts. Um, we, in any schools we teach in, we usually end up with some, we often end up with some equivalent of the Committee on Postponed Parts. It was the Committee on Postponed Parts that came up with this idea, that came up with the basic outlines um, of the, the Electoral College. It was modified a little bit by the rest of the convention when they reconvened, um, but that's where the idea came from. And I think that if you want to know why they chose this particular design, I mean, no one knows for certain, um, but I think that what was appealing about this design uh, was two things. One is that the electoral colleges, and by the way, the term electoral college doesn't appear anywhere in the Constitution. It's it's it, 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 as a reference to uh, the entire system of choosing presidents. It's actually a 20th century term. Um, in the 19th century, they talked about the gatherings in each state as the electoral colleges, um, but. Uh, they, they, the electoral colleges represent are a kind of microcosm of the legislature. They are like Congress, except they don't legislate. So the problems of corruption uh, or separation of powers, uh, you know, can be obviated. The second reason I think they they were drawn to this model was that it imported into the process of choosing a president the compromises that have been worked out earlier in the summer with respect to whole, with respect to a large states versus small states which produced a bicameral legislature and um and slave states versus free states so they didn't have to reopen those questions um they when the convention was coming to its close and they had agreed upon this it was quite clear that there was little agreement among the framers about how this would work. Um, and let me uh, take you now on to the next slide, which is uh, the first of two slides about the 12th Amendment, which spells out something about the, the process. The 12th Amendment comes about, the, the, the basic story of the 12th Amendment is in the original version of uh, in Article 2, Section 1, the details of which have been replaced by the 12th Amendment, so you don't see the whole text when I give you Article 2, Section 1. Um, but the, the uh, it basically said each elector shall cast two votes, and it did not indicate that the elector should designate one vote for president and one for vice president. Um, just cast two votes. And then the, the idea was the person who got the most votes would become president, and the person who got the second most votes would become vice president. It was kind of like a student council election uh, if, if, in their conception. The problem is that that led to a crisis in 1800 
when the two Democratic Republican candidates, uh, Jefferson and Aaron Burr, and Jefferson was clearly regarded as the person uh, who should become president. Aaron Burr was probably the most disliked man in American politics uh, of the period. But um, but the Burr and Jefferson got the same number of electoral votes. That created a tie. Um, and then and then what happens, and if you can see in the print there, if no single person gets a majority, what's invoked is the contingent election system, um, which is that the election then goes uh, to the House of Representatives. In response to this crisis of 1800, the 12th Amendment was passed saying that you um, – that you – uh, vote separately for president and vice president. This also, by the way, reinforced a rather new development in American political history, which was the formation of parties. Uh, once you had it basically said that you vote for president with a ticket of president and vice president, it reinforced it reinforces parties. Um, what I want to do, um, and you'll have access uh, to to these slides, and this is also a continuation of the very complicated and convoluted language that spells out exactly how the institution is supposed to work. But let me let me move you to um, less complicated language. This this is a slide I wrote myself about what the uh, what the key features of the electoral college are. I mean, I can imagine students asking, "Well, what is it? How does it work?" Um, and, you know, this is my, the best I can do to summarize it. And the fact that there's no easy summary uh, tells us something about the institution. One, it's a, it's a system in which the president is chosen by electoral votes that come from the states. OK, uh, if, if somebody wins a majority of the electoral votes, uh, the number of electoral votes granted to each state is equivalent to the number of its representatives in the House plus its two senators. OK. That's pretty straightforward. It's, it's largely proportional to population, but not entirely. The small states get a boost there because of the plus the two senators. Third, a key ingredient, um, and not well known, um, worth talking about with students, and it might show up next week, that how electors in each state are chosen is left to the discretion of the state legislature. There is no constitutional mandate to hold a popular election. A state legislature can decide if, if it wants to hold an election and grant uh, electoral votes on a winner-take-all basis, which is what we are familiar with and is now used in 48 states. At the time, it was called not winner-take-all, but the general ticket. The legislature could have, an election, could have popular elections but choose electors by districts or through a proportional scheme, or the legislature can decide to choose presidential electors by itself. All of these methods were used in the first 10 years and then repeatedly in the first 30 to 40 years uh, of the country's history. So, and it's a place to, you know, let me look ahead chronologically. Um, there is concern in some quarters uh, right now that if the counting of votes because of all the absentee ballots and because of the possible challenges to the absentee uh, ballot signatures or a number of other things, if the, if the count is slow or disputed, it may well still be possible for a state legislature to say, Okay, we can't. The, the popular vote didn't give us a result, so we are going to choose electors by ourselves. And the legislature. You know, it, it, it's funny you say that, and I'm I'm going to insert this question and then let you riff a little longer because Andrew asked this uh, five or ten minutes ago. Is that a significant potential factor of these faithless uh, electors? Can you tell us more about that? Well, the faithless or or this or the state legislature deciding. Mm. Which is the right. question, right? Um, there, okay, there, there are uh, there are two places where there are wiggle room here. Faithless electors is when an elector who is chosen uh, to support one candidate doesn't do it. 
Um, we've had, I don't know what it is, 50, 60 faithless electors uh, in the history of the country. They've never determined uh, the outcome of an election. I think the chances of getting a, a faithless elector are diminishing in part because just six months ago, less than that, five months ago, the Supreme Court ruled that it is constitutional for states to pass laws that will penalize uh, electors from not doing what they're mandated to do or that will call for their automatic replacement if they try to vote faithlessly. So I, I don't think that – I mean, I'd say not all states have these laws, but they will. Um, so I think that faithless electors are not a big – I don't see them as a particular problem in this election or looking – Ahead, I mean the 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 partisan divide is sufficiently great that I could see electors for either Biden or Trump voting for some other person, but not for the other side. Um, in terms, I think that in this in the forthcoming election, <coughs> in this year's election, um, I think the the possibility that a state legislature could decide to try to um, choose electors by itself is not trivial. And in, t in 2000, at the time of the disputed election between Bush and Gore, the Florida legislature, which was a Republican legislature, um, had already decided to choose electors by itself if the court cases came out to, f to favor Al Gore. So keep this in mind. I don't think it will happen, but it might happen. Back to the architecture here. Um, and certainly, you know, if other questions come up, feel free. You know, and, and Andy is Andy has full license to uh, pause me, interrupt me, whatever. Um, so I'm happy to just address your question. Um, anyway, once the electors are selected, they meet roughly a month after the election. They meet in the state capitals of each state. Why in the state capitals of each state? Uh, because they didn't want there to be collusion among the electors in different states, and they have to meet. They meet at the same time and on the same date. Uh, they didn't want anybody doing any real lobbying, um, and they cast their ballots there. Uh, although there could be disputes about the count and, and about certifying the counts, um, and then and then they send their presumably certified. Uh, electoral vote tallies uh, to Washington, and there in January, the votes are counted in a joint session of Congress in the presence of the President of the Senate, who right now would be would be Vice President Pence. But it's not altogether clear who count, does the counting, and and thus who can resolve disputes if there are, for example, two different slates of electors that come uh, from a state. There's ambiguity about that. And finally, and this is the contingent election system that I, that I talked about before, if no candidate receives a majority of electoral votes, the election reverts immediately to the House of Representatives, where each state delegation gets one vote, uh, where Vermont and California each have the same weight. That is what this institution is. Um, and it's not, it's not a simple institution. It was very unpopular from the outset. Uh, when when Virginia switched to winner take all or the general ticket from districts, uh, no less a person than Justice uh, John Marshall, the Chief Justice of the United States, said he would never vote again in a presidential election because he disapproved of Virginia's having done that. The, crit the criticisms of the system were threefold, mostly. Uh, that, uh, people did not like the emergence of winner-take-all. They did not like the fact that states were changing their methods of choosing electors from districts to winner-take-all to, to the legislature alone, that it was changing from one election to the next because people were gaming the system to see what would, it, what would most advantage uh, their, their candidate. They had decided by, you know, by 1810 or 1804 that having that the electors themselves were superfluous uh, because they were no longer given any mandate uh, to deliberate, which was which was in the minds of the framers, 
they were just messengers. And if they were just messengers, why did you have to introduce a, an element of human fallibility um, in, into the process? And people also did not like the um, the contingent election system. Hmm. This led to uh, – oh, go ahead. I've got one question for you, and – you know, I'm, there's a ton of questions coming in, by the way, and I we will work to get to everyone's. Thank you so much for being patient. And many of them do what what we at the center, and I suspect you do, to encourage them is to apply sort of these classic understandings to more contemporary issues. There are a lot of questions about the current election. So before <laughs> we move sh- on, I'm shocked I, to hear that. I'm truly shocked, shocked right? to hear that. But, but before we move on, there is one about these kind of foundational issues that you're raising. Uh, This is from our friend uh, Margie. Margie, I don't want to speak for you, but I'm going to try to read this in your voice. She asks, again, we're talking now about the the origins, the genesis of the uh, Electoral College. In her voice, I thought the founders set up the Electoral College because they didn't believe the colonial population to have been educated enough to have a true democratic vote, majority vote wins. If that's the context, is our society educated enough to elect a president based solely on this popular vote? Was that the the critical issue? I think that um, – I don't think that that was the critical issue. I think it was an issue. Um, I think we have to realize that if they had decided to have a national popular vote in 1787, that would have meant a national popular vote among – white male property owners. So the electorate would already have been confined to the better sort and probably the more educated sort. Uh, so I, I don't think that, uh, I don't think that the, the issue of the education levels was present. There's a lot of uncertainty and ambiguity, and I know this from my other book, my book on the right to vote, about whether, about whether voting was a right or a privilege at, you know, at this time. Um, people wanted to think of it as a right, but how could it be a right that, that only some people had and not other people, and that, for example, men had and women didn't have? Um, so, but they did, so it's often referred to as a privilege. The, the history of the transformation of voting from a privilege to a right is, in, some, in a sense, the history of the first half of the 19th century in the U.S. That's an oblique answer to your question, but I think it's the best I can do. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and one clar- clarifying question, maybe this is from Scott in Michigan. Scott asks, is winner take all based on a simple majority or does it need to be beyond the margin of error in an election? Uh, winner take all within a state is based on on a plurality, a simple plurality. Mm-hmm. Um, and actually, that's many people regard that as one of the defects. So it's the person who gets the largest number of votes and it does not have to be a majority. In fact, um, there have been some studies done that, sh- uh, that show that, in fact, uh, I, 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 I saw, I've seen this for the 2016 election, um, and, I'm, and I imagine it's true for a number of other elections as well. But in 2016, uh, there were many states in which President Trump uh, or candidate Trump won all of the electoral votes in which he did not have a majority in the state. Great. Thank you. Okay. So, you know, what I'm you know, those are the foundations. That's the features of this somewhat ungainly institution, which is built in with these, which is filled with these moving parts. And a lot of these are compromises, too. We can talk about that compromises with the states, about their power. Um, and it, there is just a lot of discontent. Uh, actually, in North 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 Carolina uh, has a big moment of discontent in 1812. I think when the legislature suddenly switches from district uh, allotment of 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 electors uh, to, le- to to deciding itself to choose the electors, there's a big uproar in a lot of states. And the upshot is that for the next dozen years. Uh, even a little bit more. This is this is a not terribly readable, but I I'll explain the the gist of it, and uh, you can then see its significance. Um, there are resolutions, constitutional amendment resolutions introduced into Congress every year um, from 
about 1812 or 1813 um, through 1826 or 1827. Um, and they generally are calling for banning winner-take-all winner and requiring states to use district elections. You choose electors by district so that the vote is not uniform. In most states, it would not be uniform. Most states were not – if you did it by districts, you would get multi-party mixes or multi-candidate uh, mixes. And uh, alongside that, proposals to alter the contingent election system so that it was not each state gets one vote. The most common uh, proposed reform was to let the entire Congress vote in the case that nobody won a majority of the electoral votes. These are – what this bar graph shows you is the percentage of – Yay votes on constitutional amendments. Um, the darker bars are for the Senate. The lighter bars are for the House of Representatives. The little dotted line, if you can see uh, that across your screens, indicates two-thirds. So any, any bar that goes above two-thirds was legitimate to amend the Constitution. Um, and, you know, you see that the Senate passed... Uh, these resolutions uh, four times. And if you look at the two bars on the right-hand side, and that's the same session of Congress, 1821 and 1822, uh, by the way, you can see that the House came very close to the two-thirds uh, line and the Senate went over it. Um, so we came very close to eliminating winner-take-all and making some other reforms uh, in the early 1820s. One other, I mean, and, you know, there's a, there are congressional debates every year, long discussions about it. Um, one other uh, uh, indicator of this, um, and I'm trying to figure out which order we have these slides. Um, I'm actually going to go to the next slide first, the letter to McDovey, McDovey first. This is James Madison himself in 1824, writing to George McDuffie, uh, who was a senator from South Carolina, uh, a very cantankerous man by all accounts, and who had actually, I think, wounded Andrew Jackson in the duel and been wounded by Andrew Jackson. McDuffie was prone to duels, uh, but he was absolutely adamant that he thought that the uh, Electoral College uh, needed reform and he wrote to Madison about it. And this is one of two letters in the 1820s that Madison writes. And as you can see in the letter um, here is that he says, I agree entirely uh, in an election of representatives and electors by districts is preferable to that by general ticket. Um, and in the case of, election, of, election, of electors, preferable to that also by state legislature. Um, and then in the next sentence, um, in more flowery language, he's saying he would really favor uh, a contingent system that had everybody vote uh, in a joint session of Congress rather than the states with each, uh, with each state getting one vote. These are views which he reiterates in the, in the somewhat earlier letter to George Hay, who I think, if I recall correctly, was the son-in-law a former president, um, Monroe. They, it's all everybody's everybody's connected here, um, and they're writing to Madison. And, and Madison, who had tried to stay out a lot, of, uh, stay out of a lot of these debates, is making very clear he's the foremost framer of the Constitution, and he's making very clear in the 1820s that he thinks that uh, that the system really needs change. They are never really able to cut the deal. Here is another interestingly prescient thing for us when we think about uh, about our own electoral the electoral campaigns. We know Mar Marlon Dickinson was a was a senator from New Jersey, and he was one of the leaders of the effort to reform the electoral college and to and to use districts instead of winner take all. And this is a this is a quote. Um, where basically he's saying winner-take-all sharpens partisan uh, animosity and acrimony. Uh, 
that it gets political warfare, which almost constantly agitates and distracts the larger state. He I mean, this is something we see in our own time, uh, that there's a certain fervid partisanship, which plays out in part because of winner take all. It plays out in ways um, that I think are more more acrimonious because the stakes in each state and you you those of you and i think many of you are in north carolina and surely you know this uh better than the residents of massachusetts do uh at this point now winner take all does not help let me turn now to another uh another branch of this story um and introduce to you a man named abner laycock I had never heard of Abner Laycock before I began doing the research for this book. There's not too, there's very little written about Abner Laycock. Um, he was a senator from Pennsylvania um, in the 18 teens. Um, he was well respected by by his contemporaries, but there's not, you know, he was not the he was not a, a, a major mover and shaker. But he appears in this story because Abner Laycock was the first person ever to propose in Congress jettisoning the Electoral College and having a national popular vote. Okay, these are these are quotes from the history of Congress, which is what precedes the congressional record. It's not uh, it's not verbatim. But in the middle of, of all these, what happens is that they're in the middle of these years of debates about let's get rid of the general ticket and have it um, have elections by district. And Laycock then stands up and says, yeah, if you want to have it districts, everyone's saying that the election should be closer to the people. Well, why don't we in, why don't we eliminate intermediaries altogether? Why don't we eliminate electors um, and just turn it over to the people? And uh, and he presses this idea a little bit. It has the it has a certain air of spontaneity uh, when he first mentions it. Um, and but then he, he brings it up again. And then uh, to some people's discomfort, um, he starts getting supporters, other senators, including some who had been framers of the Constitution, start standing up and agreeing with him. Some others say, no, 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 the country's too big. It would, uh, uh, you know, it's too sprawly. It wouldn't work. It's not impractical. You know, it's not practical. We can't, we can't do that. And so uh, Laycock backs off and his supporters back off to, to a motion that says, um, let's appoint a committee to see whether this can be practical because it would surely be uh, very good. And then, I mean, as I describe it in the, in my book, the other shoe drops. And this is an example of the other shoe. Um, the s- senators from slave states basically say uh, that, you know, I mean, as you can see, William Wyatt Bibb, what would be the condition of the slaveholding states? They would lose the privilege the Constitution now allows them a votes upon three fifths of their population other than free men. It would be deeply injurious to the slave states. Uh, his colleague James Barber uh, of Virginia, a very powerful figure in American politics at the period, um, goes even further and says that he will oppose even appointing a committee to look at it, to look at the issue. Um, because of slavery and because of what it would cost the South. Um, That really closes down debate on a national popular vote um, until sometime not long after the Civil War. Um, And as you will see, there will be later echoes of it. The next time that a national popular vote or the, the, the national popular vote doesn't get a significant hearing in the Senate again, and this was in 1816, it doesn't get a significant hearing again until 1950. So these episodes that I've described pretty much round out the history of reform efforts prior to the Civil War. After the late 1820s and early 1830s, winner-take-all is established every place. 
there's a kind of equilibrium. States are no longer changing the way they're doing it. Everybody's doing uh, winner take all and having popular elections, except in South Carolina. South Carolina, the legislature kept choosing um, electors until the Civil War. Um, but uh, so the, after really a couple of decades of serious dispute and serious contestation, um, the uh, uh, the reform efforts diminish again until after the Civil War. Let me let me pause there and see if there are any questions, or I can just charge right on to some stories from the post-Civil War period, which are, <laughs> if, if anything, more colorful. You know, there's a, there are a lot of questions that are queuing up, and I'm and I'm trying to sort of organize them by what you're talking about, and then saving some of the more contemporary ones for the end. But l- let me bring this question forward from Tanisha, who is in Greensboro, just to uh, the west of where I am in Chapel Hill in North Carolina. Uh, She asks, is it the push to get rid of the Electoral College at this time due to the move towards universal suffrage, influx of immigrants, and industrialization that would give more political power to the northern states? Uh, I'm sorry, can you do that again? I didn't understand the connections between the parts. Go ahead. Uh, And Tanisha, you you correct me if I'm saying it incorrectly. Um, is the push to get rid of the electoral college at this time due to the move this time towards meaning the meaning we're talking about the 18 teens, right? Yeah, uh, well, maybe actually she mentioned uh, industrialization and immigration, so maybe even maybe we'll expand that to be 19th century. Is it due to? Um, I think that Give those me. subjects are largely separate, separate from each other. I don't mm. think that it has much to do with uh, with industrialization or immigration. It is tied up with the greater pressures towards universal suffrage, or at least universal suffrage to men, and then by the middle of the 19th century uh, for women as well. Um, but I, I think that the connections of electoral college reform to – those suffrage efforts are indirect and not direct. Fantastic. Thank you. Why don't we right. have you keep going and then I'll bring questions in at the end. Sure. sure. And just really feel free. I, I, I can welcome the chance to pause and yeah. <laughs> take, a of, take, take a sip of water. <laughs> um, I wanted to give you a, what is very interesting is that in the 1870s, after the civil war, and if the Civil War is over, there is widespread anti-electoral college uh, sentiment. And I'll give you some examples of this, and then we can talk a little bit about what happened. Um, Oliver Morton was a senator from Indiana. Before that, he had been the, go- the governor during the Civil War um, of, of Indiana. He was one of the most powerful and most respected members of the Senate. He was a Republican, a Republican, you know, a kind of more radical Republican, um, and you know, mean, meaning that he embraced much more of a conception of equal rights uh, for African Americans and many other people. Um, and he was very, very interested in electoral systems. Um, he correctly foresaw the crisis election of 1876 because they, there was no mechanism in the Constitution to deal with disputed electoral votes. But these are some quotes from his speeches and writings in the 1870s. The electoral colleges have turned out to be wholly useless. useless. This electoral college is a total failure. Um, it's unrepublican, undemocratic. And then I love the last one. Experience as well as reason now suggests that the rubbish of the Electoral College be swept away entirely. That came after the crisis election of 1876, which some of you may know about. For those of you who don't, the shorthand version of it is that it was a very close election. There were 39, I think it's 39, disputed electoral votes. They didn't know how to resolve the dispute. The ultimate upshot of it was an unconstitutional compromise, uh, or I'm not sure it was a compromise that did not really conform with constitutional procedures um, that made Rutherford B. Hayes, the Republican, uh, the president for one term. And in return, um, Hayes agreed uh, to remove 
federal troops from the south and end reconstruction. So that's and that crisis and the nature of that crisis and the acrimony that followed it. Rutherford B. Hayes was was widely referred to as his fraudulency. I mean, in in the dispute, there were 39 electoral votes. Hayes needed to get all 39 of them to become president. His his opponent, Samuel Tilden, needed only one of them. But the commission awarded all 39 uh, to Hayes. So um, Oliver Morton also, I mean, just to go, go back to old Oliver for a moment, he is preparing and in the middle of a major reform, bush, uh, reform push when he dies uh, in, I think, 1877 uh, at the age of 54. Um, here's an example of other sentiment at the time. OK, uh, the New York Times, I'm, at, some, at some point I'm going to write a little article, probably I will do it as an op ed for the New York Times about the number of times that the New York Times has switched its position about electoral college reform over the last century and a half. Um, but here you can see the Times saying in 1874 that it's not a partisan question. Um, there's some probability that both Democrats and Republicans may unite in action. Um, the uh, Chicago Daily Tribune, which is a Republican-leaning paper, uh, leans in a, goes in a similar direction. Um, Harper's Weekly, uh, an important literary and political magazine, uh, says that the system is too perilous to uh, to ignore. So there's a lot of sentiment in favor of electoral college reform that has built up in the aftermath uh, of the Civil War. And then something happens. And that's something which... I want to explore with you folks. Um, Whoops. I just may have screwed this up terminal. No, I didn't. Um, No, you didn't. Right. (laughs) Right. We we can fix it. Are you trying to get down to the next slide? Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. But for some reason I went over to the, to the side and I, it's okay. No, I, I got, I got back to reality here. Um, well, what, what happens is that after the 1870s uh, and the early 1880s, there's a huge shift in opinion. And let's let's first take a look at this slide, partly because it's, you'll find it jarring. OK, um, it looks like a lot of contempt, you know, 20th, 21st century slides, except that the blue and red are reversed. Uh, the red states are the Republican states. Blue states or Democratic states. That's in 1888. Um, and what's going on at the end of the 19th century is, well, here, let me give you some more sort of clues. This is talk about the minor law. Um, well, okay. Let me tell the story and then we'll just, I'm not going to get dictated to by the slides here. What happens by the late 1880s, the early 1890s, is that uh, in most of the South, African Americans have been disenfranchised, and Republicans have been chased out of the South, and the South has become a one-party Democratic region. Um, and the, you know, the last gasp of Congress to try to reverse that is something that happens in 1890. The Federal Elections Bill, often called um, the Lodge Force Act, uh, which was a precursor. This is getting aside from this story, but it's a precursor and an early version of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Um, And it's considered seriously by Congress in 1890, but never quite passed Um, or it failed by uh, a rather slim margin. And that was really the North giving up. On, on on reforms in the South, but the the transformation of the South politically into a one party region had an enormous effect on uh, Republican thinking about um, about electoral college reform, and in effect, I'm going to flick back here for a second. Um, you know, many Republicans had favored district elections. Okay. 
But then what they began to conclude was that if they were – are you? do you folks see my pointer? Is it, or actually, they don't know how to answer me. I don't know how to hear their answers. Uh, I'm no, but I can, I can answer you. I don't know that they can. Okay. Um, well, you can see the red states you know, up there. And that band of red states, um, the sort of southernmost band – were states that generally went 55-45 for the Republicans. Then by about 1890, 1895, or even by 1890 itself, with the South having been politically transformed and the Republicans having, having given up on the South, they tried. In the early 1870s, Ulysses Grant thought that the South could still be uh, partially a Republican region that's over by the middle of the 1880s they're giving up on the south completely um and then what they can what they what the republicans end up concluding is that if they shift to a district system they will lose between 30 and 45 percent of the electoral votes in a big tier of northern states where winner take all really benefits them and they won't gain much in the South because the South is a, effectively a one-party region. Thus, a district, uh, a district selection of electors would become really disadvantageous uh, to the Republican Party, and they oppose it. At the same time, and we'll get to this, Southern Democrats become even more ferociously opposed once again to a national popular vote. But I'll take you through that a little bit. Um, we looked before we had those we had those uh, newspaper editorials in the 1870s or 1880s where Republican papers are pretty uh, sympathetic uh, to district elections. Um, now you see the Chicago Daily Tribune, the same newspaper as 20 years earlier was in favor, um, basically editorializing that if you had proportional or district elections, it would cut down Republican electoral strength heavily. And give the democracy, that means the Democratic Party, the victory every time. Um, I'm going to skip this next slide from the New York Times, 1892, but uh, it'll be in the deck and you can uh, uh, you can enjoy reading it. It's, it's very prescient in some ways. Um, there, is, uh, there is a whole episode that crystallizes this Republican view. Um, in Michigan, it takes place in Michigan in 1891-1892. Michigan had been a reliably Republican state, uh, and although it was 55-45 or 58-42 Republican, um, but then because of some quirks in local politics and third parties. The Democrats come to power in Michigan in 18, 1890 or 1891 within the Michigan legislature and supported by the Democratic governor, who is Edwin Winans. And they pass a law called the Minor Law, M-I-N-E-R. I think that's is – that, does that show up in this quote? My, right, the Minor Law. Um, John Minor was an obscure state legislator, but he happened to be the person who proposed this. The minor law divided Michigan into districts for the selection of presidential electors. Um, it was done by Democrats. It was an idea that Republicans had embraced in large numbers um, a decade or two earlier. And suddenly they were denounced. The, the Democrats doing this were denounced you know, for basically for having committed treason. I mean, this was the worst thing in the world they could, that could possibly happen. Um, forget the fact that states had done this many, many times in the past. Uh, they ignored that. Uh, the President Harrison, President Benjamin Harrison, who was himself a Republican, uh, sort of d devoted half of 1892 to sort of fighting this. A, a term was coined that I've never seen elsewhere, which was called becoming Michiganized which meant switching to district elections. There was fear that this would happen. In Michigan itself, the Republicans took uh, the Democratic legislature to state court. And when that failed, in October of 1892, three weeks before the presidential election, 
they asked for an emergency hearing at the U.S. Supreme Court to try to declare the district system to be unconstitutional. Uh, so this, we do not in 2020 live in the first year in which there have been sort of major combat like uh, like that. Um, the Supreme Court, to its credit, voted unanimously against the Republicans, but the Republicans were defended in court, by the way, by the sitting attorney general um, and by the sitting solicitor general and by a couple of previous attorneys, attorneys general. Governor Wyden's um, sort of issues here, a kind of a defense of, of district Elections basically saying if popular sentiment in a state is divided, the electoral vote ought to, ought to be divided. Why not? So what I'm, what I'm offering here, I'm focusing on Michigan, but there is a shift in Republican positions, and, um, and that is going to dampen down the prospects for reform for the next half century, okay, from about the 1890, more than that, until the 1950s. Now we turn to another Another story and another another piece of the history. Richmond Pearson Hobson is someone you have never heard of, I would imagine. Um, he's, a, he's a fascinating character. In addition to the stories I'm going to tell about him now, he actually had a considerable career as an advocate of temperance and prohibition of the sale of alcohol. Richmond Thompson was from Alabama. He went to the Naval Academy in the late 19th century. I think I think I remember this correctly that he graduated first in his class in the Naval Academy. Um, he then fought in the Navy um, in the Spanish-American War in Cuba. Um, he was involved in a very risky mission to try to rescue. Uh, some other ships. He fought very valiantly. Even the Spanish praised him. He was captured by the Spanish uh, and became a prisoner of war. He was returned to the United States uh, uh, in exchange of prisoners. And he then went on a kind of speaking tour in the country as a, as a heroic veteran and former uh, prisoner of war. Um, and became known as the most kissed man in America. He's rather dashing there in these photographs and, uh, and seems to be kind of aware of the attention um, that he's getting. But he developed this, this custom or something of he would take trains and then when he would go off the train or do a public thing, he would kiss every woman in sight who wanted to be kissed. So he was known as the most kissed man in America. I will establish the connection to the Electoral College shortly. Um, Richmond Hobson then leaves the Navy, he retires from the Navy, he goes back to Alabama, decides to enter politics. Um, and he does so as a, as a very, very well-known, nationally known war hero. Okay. He loses in his first election, but then he is elected, then he is elected to the House of Representatives, where he serves, I think in total, four terms maybe maybe three, maybe five, but uh, he's there. He's, he, it's, he, he goes to the House of Representatives first, I think in about 1908. Um, he is a supporter of women's suffrage. He is a supporter of, of the prohibition of alcoholic beverages. beverages. Neither of those causes were very popular in Alabama, by the way. Um, and he is the only Southerner between 1890 and I think 1980, certainly 1960, but I think it may extend to 1980, the only Southerner to propose a constitutional amendment calling for abolition of the Electoral College and its replacement with a national popular vote. These amendments are being introduced, you know, several each year, sometimes more. He is the only person from a Southern state who introduces it. He's really... Um, he's and in, in a sense, he's. I mean, he's from Alabama, but uh, his his constituency is is national, and he doesn't think like a southern politician at this time. In 1913 and 1914, 
he decides to run for an empty seat or a seat somebody a senator an, an Alabama senator has died and he wants to run for the uh for uh for that seat and he's squaring off against a, another Alabama representative Oscar Underwood who is much more of a traditional politician and a much more powerful figure in the House of Representatives in that campaign and what's notable this is why this is all notable in that campaign where he's running against Underwood, Underwood blasts him, or Underwood's campaign blasts him. They refuse to debate him because Hobson's a very good debater and Underwood is not. But they blast him for having supported a national popular vote. And in this internecine conflict within Alabama, they state their reasons for opposing a national popular vote openly and clearly, and it's quite different from what they might be saying on the floors of Congress. So let me, uh... And, Professor, I do want to remind you, we have about 20 minutes left, and we, we want to save some time at the end for some questions as well. Okay. I'm going, so I, will, I will scamper through this then because I do want to <laughs> move on to, to some other things. Um, I got, I'm, I guess I've gotten too lovingly into the details of Richmond Hobson, but – in these pamphlets, they basically um, say if you favor a national popular vote, you're going to win. If there's a national popular vote, black people are going to vote, and we can't allow that. And even if we don't, if the black people don't vote, then we will lose half of our influence because if you have a national popular vote, the only thing that counts is how many people who vote, how many people vote. Whereas under the, under the electoral college, you get the same number of electoral votes even if nobody's voting. Which, by the way, looking to the present, the Electoral College incentivizes voter suppression. So anyway, the, uh, these pamphlets really make very clear what the Southern position is. Let me move to uh, closer to the uh, mid 20th century. The issue, start, the issue of reform starts to revive uh, in the 1940s. Emanuel Seller is, I don't think he's quite there at that point, but he will become the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, a very, very powerful figure. Um, and, and, the, and part of a group in the North that is pushing reform. Um, but Southerners, and this is a, a Southern treatise, um, in the minds of many Southern politicians, the Electoral College is viewed as their last bulwark to protect the South against the civil rights movement and incursions by the federal government. Uh, Charles Collins' book is extremely widely read um, in the late 1940s and, and into the 1960s, and Southern politicians leaned on it uh, very heavily. After a number of other uh, efforts, let me take a look. Do we have the right side here? Okay. I'm gonna, we'll, we'll skip that one for the moment. After about 15 years of jockeying about uh, district and proportional plans, what finally happens in the 1960s is the coalescence of a movement for a national popular vote, okay, to, have a, to amend the Constitution to have a national popular vote. It is supported by, the, by 1966 or 1967, it is supported outside of Congress by a startling array of organizations with different ideologies. The American Bar Association favors it. The Chamber of Commerce favors it. The AFL-CIO changes it, favors it. The League of Women Voters, it has tremendous support outside of Congress. Within Congress, Emanuel Seller, whom you saw the slide of, is the key mover in the House. In the Senate, the key mover is the young Democratic Senator Birch Bayh of Indiana, who, who is chair of the Constitutional Amendment Subcommittee of the Judiciary Committee. This photograph of George Wallace there, he's figuring largely in a lot of people's thinking in the late 1960s because there was fear that Wallace, as a third-party candidate, would win enough electoral votes to uh, become a kingmaker in the 1968 election. These three other gentlemen are, uh, play a different role. What happens in, this, in, uh, in Congress is that the House approves the constitutional amendment by an 83% vote. Uh, 
It's it's stunning. It's a real. It's a, just a stunning outcome. They need two thirds. They get eighty three percent. It then goes to the Senate, and it is stalled in the Senate for a year, from September of nineteen sixty nine to September of nineteen seventy. It is stalled um, in good part because of the efforts of James Eastland of Mississippi, whom you see a photograph there, who's chair of the Judiciary Committee, Strom Thurmond, who was a member of the Judiciary Committee, and Sam Irvin of North Carolina, who was also a member of the Judiciary Committee. Even it gets after it gets reported out of the committee, those gentlemen work together to lead a filibuster and prevent a vote from ever being taken in the Senate. By and his allies um, fall, fall, fall about four or five votes short of having the votes to override a filibuster and thus try to pass uh, the, the, the amendment. That's in 1970. Um, and here are some a uh, couple of quotations or quotations from this you know, the, the previous one. This is from a Republican member of Congress. It has become a condition of American life. Uh, and th that there's actually hope. This is in February of 1969 that the debates over electoral reform may come to an end. Um, and there was supposed to be a table in here. I don't think it is. Oh, maybe it is. Uh, it doesn't matter. Um, there is a table somewhere in this pack, which is just a reprint of something from uh, from, from the book, um, which shows how the what the breakdown of the votes in Congress. There were two votes in the Senate on on closure on overcoming the filibuster. They looked very similar, um, but basically what I, what that shows is that contrary to conventional wisdom, it was not the small states who opposed electoral college reform. The small states voted the same way as most other states. Most small states, most small state senators voted in favor of a national popular vote. The opposition was sent, was centered in the South. Um, again, continuing a legacy that had be, that went back 160 years uh, by now. Um, let's see. Um, let's see. I'm going to since since I don't I, see anything there, it doesn't matter. <laughs> I, I, I want to round I want to round this up. Let, let me or let me just conclude it this way. Um, that was the closest that we have ever come to replacing the electoral college with a national popular vote, and it happened because of these regional tensions linked to race. There's another effort in the 1970s which doesn't come as close but where the regional efforts are also present. And that leads us into what, in my book, I refer to as the, the last period so far in the history of electoral college reform, which is the years from 1980 to, to the present. And it has been an extraordinary, it's a period that we've lived most of our lives and we take it for granted. We think this is the way things always are, but it's not. It's been an exceptional period in which one political party, the Republican Party, has opposed all consideration of electoral college reform. And that party has been strong enough to stymie any significant public debate until very recently, um, and certainly to stymie any, any uh, discussion of it in Congress. There has not been a hearing in Congress on electoral college reform since the 2000 election. Uh, there have been gatherings that are not formal hearings, but there has been uh, there, there has been no formal hearing. Whether or not that will shift in the wake of this election is a very important story. But let me, I'm sorry to have run on with so many historical details, but let me see how many of your questions I can grab. Great. And take a moment, to take, take some water, and I'm going to start to, <laughs> to queue up these questions. I'm going to try to move... Um, Try to organize them maybe in theme and in topic. Uh, you may, I, I doubt you noticed, but the audience chat has been very robust. I appreciate everyone's uh, perspectives, particularly respectful debate and being able to share in very vulnerable places. Thank you for doing that. Um, let's let's start with this. And, you know, we've got about 10 minutes left. And so we'll do this in sort of rapid fire lightning round style. Um, let's start with just this basic 
question. It was one of the very first questions we got. It's from Tanya. And Tanya asks, who can change or get rid of the Electoral College? Can you just give us like a clear, short answer? Who, who can make these changes if and when they are agreed upon? To make them durably and institutionally, it would have to be done through a constitutional amendment. And it would have to come from, which would mean that it would have to be approved by the House and the Senate and then go out to the states. Um, that means, in effect, uh, monitoring or uh, responding to, organizing, putting pressure on members of Congress. Uh, they can do it. There are efforts going on now to circumvent Congress and to circumvent uh, the, uh, the constitutional amendment route through a, uh, a, a strategy called the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact which is worth your looking up if you're interested in this. Um, it has built a pretty national movement, but has gotten almost nowhere in the South. Um, and it's an attempt to, circ to, to, to really do a little bit of an end run around the Constitution, whether it, can, it has a lot of support nationally, and again, that's why it's worth looking up, whether it can survive legally and constitutionally is a very big question. This question is from Mike. Um, Mike asks, how do you think or do you think that the popular vote would change and look completely different without the Electoral College? Um, in his mind, at least, it, it seems that looking at the popular vote under the EC is apples and oranges. I think that I'm not quite sure it's apples and oranges, but it's different size apples or um, it's it, it's not the same thing. I think he's absolutely right. That you can't just take what the popular vote would be. The campaigning will be completely different if there's a national popular vote. Um, yeah, no my doubt. guess is that is that turnout will be higher um, in elections if there's a national popular vote. Um, and I, you know, I, um, I think that uh, so I, I agree. You can you cannot make that translation. What we do know, you know, the things that we can predict are that the a national campaign with a national popular vote will be not concentrated on eight swing states. Uh, it will make sense for any candidate to get as many votes as he or she can from wherever they can get them. Um, and I think that turnout will increase substantially. Thank you. Um, again, this is a little bit of a of a Technical question, maybe, but it's an important one to clear up. Uh, it's clarifying. Sean asks, what if there's a tie in a state's popular vote? What's the next step to determine who gets that state's electors? That is a very good question that I have not been asked before. So Sean gets a lot of credit uh, for that. And I, well, the answer is, A, I don't know. B, I'm quite certain that it would be a matter of state law and that mm -hmm. each state or state legislature probably has some provision about what to do in that case. And it's a native a matter of federal mm -hmm. law. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let me move through a couple of other questions. Um, so Scott, who is in Michigan, asks, would it be easier to push one's individual state to make a change away from the winner takes all approach or versus pushing for an amendment to change the entire election process? A very, very good question. And my book, in my book, I try to deal with that a fair amount. There have been many efforts in Michigan, as I mentioned, but elsewhere, even, even recently, even in North Carolina um, to move states away um, from winner take all towards a proportional or district system. It's always tempting. It's always more manageable. The problem with the dynamics of that is that, uh, at least as many people imagine this, that a state will lose influence if it's one of the first states to switch, say, to a proportional system. Um, then it's the block of votes that it can be casting for any one uh, candidate will be lessened and it will quotes have less power. I'm not sure I buy that argument, but that argument has been used repeatedly against efforts to do this on a state by state basis. Um, 
And a lot of states have taken serious looks at this, including North Carolina and California in 2007, 2008. Uh, it's something worth looking at. Uh, it's more manageable. It's a lot more manageable than amending the Constitution, but it may not stick as well. And actually, Mike has a, a good um, suggestion for the title of your next book. He thinks it should be, why aren't there term limits in Congress? Right, <laughs> right. to which I don't have an answer. answer. <laughs> uh -huh. um, let's see. Uh, let, me, let me ask this question. Um, Andrew asks, is it conceivable to have a meaningful electoral college reform when there's such strong partisan fervor? I think I think that it's pretty much not possible, and uh, I mean certainly, and certainly if the parties you know divide on electoral college reform, um, I think that that makes it I think it makes it very difficult. It's you know I I um, the two periods, and I've talked about both of them, when we've come closest to major electoral college reform, the years between 1815 and 1825, and the years of the 1960s and 1970s, are both years when the party system was in flux, when there was not a rigid, acrimonious two-party system. I mean, in the, in the late 1960s, early 1970s, there were at least three and maybe four parties, even though there were only two labels. Uh, the Democratic Party was not unified. Uh, the northern, northern and southern wings were not unified, and in fact, the southern wing of the party was in the was was in the in the midst of or in the early stages of a migration into the Republican Party. So the party system was unsettled, and I think that that created some space for reform to happen. I think that with the kind of partisan lineup that we see now, the partisan world we inhabit now, be very difficult. But you know, in my final minutes here. Um, there is a very strong pro-democratic reform movement in this country now, particularly among the young. Um, and Electoral College is one of the reforms um, that young people and many others are seeking. I mean, within the Democratic Party, uh, my Senator Elizabeth Warren, when she was running for president, uh, openly embraced having a national popular vote. So there, that's present within the Democratic Party. I think it's not beyond the realm of possibility. I'm not betting that this is going to happen. But I think it's not beyond the realm of possibility that if the, Repu if the Republican Party loses badly uh, in this election, both in Congress and the presidency, and if it loses or almost loses some states that have been reliably Republican, like Texas and Georgia, I think there may be a lot of rethinking among Republicans about the desirability of winner take all and the desirability of the electoral college. Here's one question from Hillary. She asks, what are your opinions on ranked voting? I think ranked choice voting is basically a good thing. Um, it's on the ballot here in Massachusetts on Tuesday. I suspect that we will adopt it. Um, I think that it it is it is very. I think it's particularly valuable in primaries, um, and I, I think that it it can help produce a more more reasoned outcomes. And from the point of view of a voter, it gives you a chance to not feel like you have the option of voting for the candidate who you really, really like, but you think can't win, or voting for uh, the, you know, the, the, less, the less undesirable of the two major candidates. You can vote, for, you can cast your votes in effect for both of those. So I think from the point of view of voters and, ele and electoral participation, uh, it's a good thing, and it may well try to help to revitalize the parties as well. Uh, we're almost out of time, Professor. I've got one last question for you, and I apologize to everyone whose question we weren't asked, uh, able to ask explicitly. But here's the final question, and I, and I mean this you know, both quite literally and, and earnestly. Um, Professor, why do we still have the Electoral College? <laughs> um, 
because a because it's hard to get rid of. Uh, I mean, because the Constitution. Uh, let me put it this way: the Constitution is hard to amend. Um, B because of the history of race uh, and uh, and racial oppression and, and racial politics in this country. And third, because once political parties get formed and become very powerful, political parties are in the business of winning elections, not necessarily promoting democracy. And at different points in time, enough leaders of political parties have preferred to keep the institution, even if they knew it was flawed, because they thought it would benefit their candidates. That's the best I can do for a short summary. And it's a great way to end tonight's uh, tonight's session. Um, Professor Alex Kayser, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your insights. Well, thanks, and thank, thanks to all of you who stayed. I'm, I'm, I, I, have, I have a little thing which gives me some numbers, and um, I'm impressed, and I hope I didn't carry on too long about these 19th century stories, but um, they aren't as accessible as the modern stories, and I, I wish everyone luck with their teaching um, about this. I know students are very – I gave a lecture this morning to high school students in Boston, um, and there are, there are students who are very interested and animated uh, about this, and I think that we as educators want to want to do our best to help them to understand this very unusual institution.